Welcome into the Illini Enquirer podcast. It is the first Monday after a game in a season, and that means Jay Lehman, our Illini Enquirer analyst, is here. Big Ten Network, you see him. You heard him on the call for Eastern Illinois. And, and Jay, uh, you gave me a list of takeaways from this game. I love how you segmented this out. Uh, so we are going to get into that, uh, and we sure. will preview what is a huge game against number 22 Kansas. Uh, could be a very, very good crowd as fans are looking for a reason to really, really buy into this team this year. Uh, but first of all, I, I just want to ask you, or, or just kind of start with this, like that's what you want to see from a Big Ten opponent against an FCS opponent, right? Like we yeah, saw in Kansas is, against Lindenwood, but yeah, this, that's what you want to see from Illinois. And, and, we, and then I did the Purdue game, Purdue against Indiana State. I mean, uh, uh, it, was, it was similar, but you do want to go out and take your business. Uh, here's the deal with these games. They go one of two ways. One, they're not even a ball game from probably the first – quarter to mid second quarter on or two you got to hang in there the, the the fcs team hangs in there and the and the team gets tighter that's supposed to win you know the fbs team gets tighter and tighter in this close game i've been on both sides of them we we blew out eastern in 2006 but western we were we, we were only up seven nothing in the fourth quarter ended up winning 21 nothing but it happens so uh hey they took care of business I mean, like I said, August and September, is there a better time to be an Illini fan? No, because you're just excited about the potential of this football team. So I I, I know we get up on Hopium. I know we get really high this time of year. I know it's an FCS team. I know what I'm going to say as the caveat of the FCS uh, team that we played, but I'm excited. Well, and there's that caveat, Jay, but... I think this is kind of an ideal schedule when you have nine big 10 games and you have a power five opponent coming up uh, and then you have a Mac opponent coming up. Like, I don't mind like th if this is the first game, like guarantee yourself a win, figure out a little bit about yourself. Right. Well, like, Ryan I, think Walters, this is kind of I was, nice I was listening I was listening to former defensive quarter Ryan Walters in, per, in preparation for, for the Purdue game. And a reporter asked him, Hey, you know, how many uh, FCS opponents would you want on the schedule? He goes, well, nine conference games, how about three? I thought it was kind of funny. He said it in jest as a joke because Purdue has, you know, four top 10 teams on their schedule, including a nine kind of uh, with Notre Dame. And uh, they, they've had, they've, they're the only team in the Big Ten to have a losing record in non-conference play the last decade. And so I think it's like, why in the world are we playing all these teams when we need to get ready to play nine conference games? So I understood what his point was. It was, it was kind of funny. So uh, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, all right, let's start your takeaways, Jay. You gave me five of them, and we'll hit on a lot of things involved in all of this. But takeaway number one is about the Illini wide receivers. What did you notice about them? Yeah, I just thought they were playing at a, at a higher level as far as route running and catching the football. Guys, we have seen a lot of times where we have had dropitis on this football team, right? Where we're like, hey, man, we're just not catching the ball great. Or the ball's there and we're dropping it. So what I thought, you know, we've got some legit all-conference contenders at uh, receiver. You know, I'll go as far as say I don't think Pat Bryant makes all those catches that he makes last year that he made on Thursday. He was making some tough catches, especially – his second touchdown catch was a very difficult catch. Um, so I think Pat Bryant's improved. I think he's always had all Big Ten potential. He's looked like all Big Ten at times, and other times he doesn't look like that. So I thought he was playing at a higher level. I think Zachary Franklin, more than being a burner, is just really wily and a veteran and knows how to get open. Really, really savvy route runner. We saw that on kind of his double-triple move that he did inside the five-yard line. Almost brought down that other – that other pass as far as guys that go up and get the ball. They high point the football and they snatch it off the top of people's helmets and stuff. We have not had that. When I saw a little bit of that with Zakar Franklin, I saw a little bit of that with uh, Pat Bryant. I thought Malik Elsey, you know, uh, I, I got to listen to your post game pod and I said on the air, it looked like Elsey stumbled on that route at about the 10 yard line. And I said, oh, there's no way he's going to get there. Recovered and it was able to run under that ball. Uh, so it, it just shows some maturity there to make that, you know, he had some drops last year, but, you know, caught that ball under pressure, I, you know, in the limited time that he got, I know Ashton Hollins has been banged up. I really liked what I saw out of him able to put his foot in the ground on his one catch, get outside and get yards after catch for 16 yards. You might not think that's a, that's a big thing, but that's a big thing for the Illini who are looking to get chunk plays. I thought they were 
very innovative on how to use uh, to get Canary Welcher, Canary Welcher the ball one time on a screen. And they blocked well at the point of attack on the edge. I thought they were they were very innovative at the goal line. We know Lunny likes to use tight ends in the red zone and getting Tanner Arkin wide open and scheming them up. Having Tanner Arkin block for a second or two to get the linebacker's eyes off into the run play, and then he's wide open. So I think it was a big pickup in the offseason with Justin Stepp. I think Justin Stepp, uh, the receivers coach, has a track record. Uh, you know, going back to you know SMU, Arkansas, and at South Carolina of developing players, it's a little bit different style than George McDonald was, and I think they've responded to it. I thought they just played at a better fundamental level. Again, I know it's an FCS opponent, but they looked clean on their routes. They were catching footballs. They were blocking, and it wasn't just those guys. We're deep at that position, uh, so much so that it's a battle to get on the field, which is what you want, and so. I was I haven't been this excited about the receivers in a long, long time. Um, and I'll say this is, you know, my first my first answer to a question is always a monologue. So hang in there with <laughs> me, guys, because, I mean, Jeremy's got a lot more. It, it kind of seemed like year one of Barry Lunny was, hey, we've got Chase Brown is kind of all we got. We're going to give him the rock. It kind of felt like last year, you know, hey, we don't have the running game, but Isaiah Williams, how do we get him in space and how do we get him touches? Here, it, it kind of seems like we have a complete offensive scheme. Now, whether it's executed like that against better competition, we're yet, we've yet to see. But we have a complete scheme with multiple weapons that we can beat you with. Yeah, I mean, we, there are questions about this group just simply because you're replacing right. Isaiah Williams and Casey Washington, right? But like Zakari Franklin, he only had two catches, Jay, but that non-catch was really impressive. Uh, so I, I think he's, I think he's going to be very, very good. Pat Bryant, you, you said it, uh, went up and got those those plays. But there's more depth, I believe, in that group. And you feel like you we'll get into the running backs here. There's some depth there. But I wanted to hit on Luke Altmeyer just to tie into this. Felt like he trusted his wideouts, right? Like late sure. in the season, I just saw John Paddock just throw it up for his guys. Like he went and trusted these guys. Like Luke just seemed to hesitate a little bit, like needed to see the guys open. I saw a confidence in, in Luke Altmaier that his guys would go make plays too. I thought that was a big difference, even though again, caveat, we're going to keep saying it, EIU, FCS right. team. There did feel like a difference where he saw one-on-one -on -one coverage, Jay, he was attacking it and saying, my guy will right. go get it. Yeah. And, and, and this is the timing aspect, right? I mean, if you're going to run timing routes, you got to, you got to really trust your receivers. And, you know, I thought he trusted them twice. I thought he trusted it too much. There's two throws in the goal line. I thought he had threw out really three bad throws the whole night. He had one, the first throw, he just missed Zakari Franklin on the first throw of the game. And then down in the red zone, he was trying to force it to Zakari Franklin on, you know, kind of a hitch and go. And he forced one to Boyer into triple coverage, uh, but he threw it high as far as the Boyer one goes. But other than that, I thought his processing time was really good. I thought he had time, so that really helped. Uh, I, I didn't really like him running and taking a hit and getting up a little bit slow against Eastern Illinois, so I was like, ugh. In my mind, I was kind of like, ugh. But overall, yes, we challenged him to go to from a 56K modem dial-up internet to an Ethernet, and we believe that he's all the way at fiber optics. So uh, he is, he is, he's definitely processing at a different rate, and that comes with trust and and remember, he's had a whole other year not only in his system, but to run routes with these guys, right? I mean, to to throw with these guys, to work with these guys. So it looks like they're going to take a step in the passing game. Obviously, there's still a lot to be said up with 11 games left to play. All right, I want to take a minute to tell you about Home Field Apparel because they are the premium collegiate apparel brand, and they're based in nearby Indianapolis. Home Field sent me a few shirts, and what I love about them is, of course, they have incredibly comfortable, well-fitting shirts, but they also have officially licensed apparel with vintage college designs, and they have more than 180 plus available colleges, including, yes, your Illinois Fighting Illini. They have great gear for the upcoming football season, so for the warm weather games, check out their Script Illini t-shirt, the Orange Ringer tee, the vintage Oski Wild while helmet or for the fall chillier games check out the script Illini hoodie the flying Illini hoodie the flying Illini quarter zip and if they're still available you might want to check out homefieldapparel.com for this check out their script bomber jacket it is 
awesome. Also, don't miss their Can't Miss Kickoff 2024 campaign. So Homefield is giving away these special football boxes, and these platinum VIP boxes include three never-before-seen items from your school that are not available anywhere else. They're curated so fans have new gear to wear all season long, suitable for all weather conditions. And these platinum boxes also include other exclusive items, including a new hat or ringer, a VIP koozie, and a 2024 Platinum Pass, which guarantees 20% off and early access to your school's football releases through the 2024 season. The football boxes are available on August 9th, so these will sell out quick, so go check them out. Go to homefieldapparel.com to check out their great selection of Illini gear and use code Illini24, that's all capitals, Illini24, for 15% off. That's Illini24 for 15% off at homefieldapparel.com. Takeaway number two for you, Jay, is about a big transfer addition in the trenches and maybe one of the most underrated additions of the offseason. Yeah, you know, as far as if I'm looking at the tape and I let's say, again, you know, we, we don't know who anybody is. There's no numbers. And I'm just looking at, I don't, I don't know if this is, is this J.C. Davis? Is this Zachary Franklin? Is this some other guy that's a, that's a portal guy? And, and just I'm just grading the film, and I don't know anybody. Melvin Priestley at right tackle really popped off for me. Now, I do think that J.C. Davis is probably ahead in the pass protection game. But when it came to run blocking, uh, I, I thought they would, they would run more behind Geske and J.C. Davis. I don't, certainly don't think they played bad. But it looked like they wanted to run behind Chrysler and and Priestley. And Priestley is one of those guys that is really nasty if he gets his hands and his face on you to finish guys. We saw that on a goal line run where he just destroyed. I don't know if it was a linebacker or a defensive back. I mean, the guy got swallowed, kind of a, a block where the helmet hits the ground first, which means your your feet are up in the air, right? And uh he just had a lot more striking power than I imagined that he had. Sometimes these bigger guys, they're, they're kind of lean on you and they'll kind of, you know, grab you and stuff like that. And that's okay. But he actually has some real striking power at the point of attack. He moved a lot better than I thought he would. Like when they pulled great him athlete. Yeah. around, like his feet were a lot better. He, None, nobody was challenged with a great pass rush, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve my judgment on like, okay, what's the pass protection like? But man, his feet he he is an NFL player. Uh, I'm gonna say it right now. He'll be an NFL player with Bart Miller and 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 Brett Bielema's tutelage if he continues to go on this track. I don't think he had uh, no, no offense to Grambling. I'm not sure he had the resources there that he needed to maybe become the best player that he could be. But I, we talked to, I had a chance to talk to, to Brett about it, uh, you know, pregame in the coaches meeting and just said, Hey, you know, talk about the portal. And obviously tackle was an emphasis in the portal. Okay. Uh, they looked at hundreds of, hundreds of tackles in the portal. I mean, it was like, who, who's this? And it was so funny. Uh, so he told the JC Davis story and he said, well, you know, he came up and he was the really our top target. And, you know, we flew down there and basically the day it opened up that we could meet with somebody, we had a breakfast date, at, you know, basically the New Mexico equivalent of IHOP. And we ate breakfast from 7.30 to 10.30 and we were able to get the deal done, you know, and beat out maybe more lucrative offers because pitch that we could develop him into a great player, you know. The Melvin Priestley was a similar story where they brought him, Lunny, and Aaron Henry down there to, I believe it's Ruskin, Louisiana. I believe that's the town where Grambling's I believe that's the town where Grambling's at. And uh, they sat down with him, similar place, got breakfast with him, and uh, they were able to close the deal. But it was interesting because he said, we looked at four SEC tackles in the portal. We watched them all play against LSU, who have two really good edge rushers. And we also saw that Grambling played LSU in a non-con. So I could really compare these SEC tackles to Melvin Priestley. He's like, and Melvin did better than the SEC tackles. But nobody was going after Melvin. So when we saw this on tape, we said, we think we've uncovered something here. They get him on campus, wins the job really in spring, and has been just super, super impressive in transforming his body 
And I can tell you as a linebacker, when I'm watching film, he is one guy that I would be aware of when he pulls that you better get downhill fast, that he doesn't get to turn his shoulders and come upfield. Once a lineman turns his shoulders and come upfield, you have all 300 plus pounds coming this way. You want 300 pounds going to the side and hitting him that way. And so you see a guy like Priestley, if I'm playing a guy like that, I'm like, man, I've got to really be up on reading when he pulls and when he comes out because I've got to strike him beforehand because he has a mean strike to him. So I'm very excited about Priest. I can't say he was my most exciting uh, portal guy when I heard about it, but when I saw it on tape, heard the coaches talk about him, saw what he did at uh, against Louisiana State last year, those edge rushers, I'm sky high on Melvin Priestley. Again, caveat, FCS team. But, man, I'm talking a lot. I'm just excited. I know, man. I got to get Jeremy in here. So, Well, no, J.C. Davis, I thought, looked really good. Uh, and he yeah. has since he's gotten here. But Melvin Priestley, if you solved both left tackle and right tackle this offseason in the transfer portal, what a, what a huge win, plus Zachary Franklin on the offense. That, sure. That'd be huge because right tackle was a huge weakness for them uh, last year. Uh, and I thought the offensive line, interior Jay at times, struggled a little bit, but I, I thought mostly encouraging. Of course, they had bigger tests uh, here coming yeah, up. They struggled a little bit at times with the movement at Eastern yeah. Illinois, right? They like I thought their uh, nose tackle um, was really good, by the way. Yeah, that, that nose tackle yeah. was fighting. They, yeah. they, they, uh, uh, Trajan Lewis is a good football player uh, for Eastern. Uh, Drake Van Hefty, not a bad football player. Like they, they have some guys in there that are nifty and, and maybe. Uh, not as big, but maybe just as quick or quicker than some you, you'd play against. Uh, they're probably not every down Big Ten players, right? That's why they're FCS. But but they they had some guys and they struggled. Uh, they struggled a little bit with movement up front in the interior, and it it led to some no gains. It led to a rare tackle for loss against Caden Fagan, right? So uh, that's something they have to clean up. When they, they do the best when, hey, people try to go man on man with them because they have some mauler in them, right? And what I really liked is this is the best I've seen since Chase Brown of us getting to the edge. Oh, yeah. We were able to get to the edge, and maybe that's Aiden Lawfrey, uh, maybe that scheme. I think it has to do a lot with, with, with the blocking on the edge from the receivers, but also Melvin Priestley. He was getting some phenomenal edge blocks. And let's not forget Tanner Arkin and Boyer, who are big bodies. Uh, we, we can't forget about them in the blocking game. They're really big tight ends on the scale of what tight ends look like. Boy, there was a lot of 12 personnel. Uh, in the, in the oh, yeah. Game, Jay. A lot of 12 personnel. I know uh, Barry Lunny likes it. Uh, let's go to uh, – you mentioned wide receiver walking. I thought it was phenomenal. Like, sure. I, this is a physical right. group of receivers. Right. Let's stick with the, the offense with the running back. So take away three – what is your takeaway about what you saw from the running backs? You know, I wrote I wrote all these down, and so now I'm like, okay, just on my on my, on my phone here. Okay, yeah. So tailback, tailback. First of all, we were playing in the baby pool last year with our depth, right? I mean, it was like like six inches, you know, and uh, as far as water depth goes, with with the with the running backs. I mean, at times we just had Reggie Love and I think Christian Boback and maybe one other guy. Like playing tailback, right? I mean, that was that was it. And I think Brett got into the situation where he's like, I never want to be in that situation again, where we, we don't even have a tailback that we can hand the ball off. And 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 some of that fed into John Paddock just airing it out. We we just weren't that healthy at running back. Um, so I, I really, really liked what I saw out of Caden Fagan. I think Caden Fagan can be an all big 10 performer. I really do. Uh, he has the ability and the skill set. The big difference between him and McCray is his acceleration out of the hole and his ability to pick up his feet. Uh, what you'll see about with, with, with Josh is he's a good player. He just doesn't have the same acceleration or doesn't pick up his feet enough. He'll get tripped up as much. Well, you'll, you'll see Caden Fagan almost jump over a guy and get his feet up and fall forward for five, six, seven more yards, right? I mean, he'll, somebody will try to cut his leg. He'll jump over him and fall forward. It'll be a nine-yard game. You're like, wow, that was nine yards, right? So it's like, it's 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 pretty insane. But they all do something different, right? I mean, they're really I, – I was surprised in the coaches' meetings on Friday when Aiden Lawfrey was the starter. I, that was a surprise to me because um, he did start the first series, maybe the first two series. The first series was long. So I, I would say they're they're one A and one B. I don't think one of them is necessarily a starter or not. But
but it was it was telling to me that Aiden Lawfrey got the first series. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and and talking and talking to Coach Bielum, I mean, he's like he has about the same size as Chase and is starting to run very similar to Chase Brown, which I mean, that's it's a pretty high comparison for a guy that ran for 16, 700 yards, right? So I was anxious to see that. And I, I think Aiden Lawfrey, and they think he's probably the most improved player they have. So that's 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 a that's a big statement. And I saw that out of Aiden Lawfrey. I yeah, saw Jay, can I ask you like yeah. what last 2022? I mean, you saw all these stretch runs with Chase, sure. right? Like that like was so good for them. What right. is having that dynamic plus Caden doing what he does, sure. turning nothing into a huge chunk or always getting yards? Like, what does that element do for their offense? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So uh, there's a world of difference between outside zone, also known as the stretch play, and inside zone. So inside zone is built for for a guy like Caden Fagan to cut back, uh, to either go forward or to cut back between the tackles. Okay. Stretch is, hey, I'm trying to, we defensively, we call it elephants on parade. You see a bunch of linemen just, you know, yeah. going to the sideline. And what when all those all those linemen, so I'm mean, going to say I have five linemen here, you know, and there's gaps in between each of these, right? When you're going to the sideline, all those gaps are moving. And so you're trying to get the defense to move to be, you know, in those gaps and get them running sideways rather than attacking downhill. And then you're going to have a quick running back either get to the edge or put his foot in the ground and go and create that cutback lane on the outside zone. But in order to have a good outside zone player, you really got to have someone with some elite speed that can stretch, right? That you're worried that this guy's going to get to the edge. I Nobody's necessarily worried that Josh McCray, Jordan Anderson – Maybe Kane Fagan could get to the edge, right? But not that elite speed to get to the edge where it's like, man, I got to be on my horse or he's going to outflank us, right? Um, I always think of that Braveheart line, like ride around outside them and flank them. You know, like, I, I mean, that's, I'm showing my age here, guys. That's like a 30 year old movie, but you know, you ride outside and flank them. You don't want to get flanked, right? And so uh, Aiden Lawfrey has that ability. So I'm going back and forth between, okay. Aiden Lawfrey's in the game. There's a totally different subset of runs for Aiden Lawfrey. There's a totally different subset of runs for Caden Fagan, right? They can do the same runs, obviously, but they run better run plays, you know, differently. So basically when I'm preparing as a defense, now I have a whole nother subset of plays that I have to prepare for because these two guys are really different, right? And they run different things. I love the little, like, it wasn't necessarily a jet sweep, but like little reverse to Aiden Lawfrey to get him on the edge. Uh, With both of them in the game, Caden lead blocking like that. That was creative stuff. Yeah. Love that. Like I love, I, I love, I love two guys, two guys in there at the same time. I thought they did a good job of not necessarily using tempo, but they were be in the huddle, rush to the line, get lined up in the bunch formation, which is a huge tendency of a pitch. I'm up there as a backer, like, duh, it's a pitch. I don't know. Yeah, you wasn't ready for it. They weren't lined up correctly. They got flanked on the pitch play uh, on on the sweep play. They did use Caden Fagan on that play as well, because uh, so he can do something. But they usually will pitch it into the boundary with Fagan because there's not a lot of space and you're going downhill. They'll usually go to the field more with Lawfrey because he has enough, you know, to to get to the field as far as the wide side. But it's a totally different set of plays uh, that Lawfrey and Fagan can do. And so as a defense, you got to prepare and be ready for it. It's a mix and match. One thing a good offensive corner always does, he will make you go horizontal. He will make you go vertical. He will make you attack the run. He'll throw a little quarterback uh, quarterback draw, uh, quarterback draw, run in there. He'll make you go back and forth. And he'll never keep doing the same thing, especially early in the game. And Barry did a good job of that. Hey, guys, fall is right around the corner. That means kids back at school. That means the schedules get a little busier. And that's why there's no better time to check out Factor. Fuel up for all these busy days with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals in time for the fall with a great menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. And Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. So make today the day you kickstart a new healthy routine. What are you waiting for? 
With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you always have new flavors to explore. And you can crush your wellness goals with dietitian approved meals and ingredients that you can trust. Make your day delicious too, from breakfast to dessert. Stay fueled with easy, nutritious options. And you get to keep your kitchen time to a minimum. Factor meals are ready in two minutes. No shopping, prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. So enjoy effortless support for your lifestyle. Choose from six menu preferences to help you manage calories, maximize protein intake, avoid meat or simply eat well balanced so head to factormeals.com slash illini50 and use code illini50 to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next month that's code illini50 at factormeals.com slash illini50 to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next month while your subscription is active all right jay let's switch to the defensive side of the ball and uh, your takeaway number four was about some defenders who kind of caught your eye uh, including a freshman uh, who, who looks like he could make a pretty big impact because he doesn't look like a normal freshman. So who are some of the defenders that caught your eye? Well, you remember, do you remember like, again, I'm showing my age here, but I'm getting old. So ESP in the magazine would do like these articles and it would say like next. And it was like yes. LeBron James yeah. on like, like, like this is like yeah. the next guy, right? Like uh, Bryce Harper was on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure not. I, I'm not just guys. I'm not saying that this guy I'm going to talk about is next. Okay. But when I was in meetings, and, and I think that's the value, I have the opportunity to talk to the coaches one-on-one. And uh, Aaron Henry just said, hey, I am so excited to see Joe Barna play. And this kind of caught me because Barna's not really on the two deep. I mean, he's close. Uh, but uh, as far as outside linebackers, from what I saw, it was going to be, you know, Gabe and Seth and Alec Bryan and, and Daniel Brown if he was healthy and, you know, and, and so to throw in Joe Barna is kind of like, okay, he, he made a point to mention Joe Barna. Like, hey, this guy, make him plays. Obviously, it led Wheaton North, I think, the two state titles in 21 and 22. And and I was like, okay, I, I'll keep an eye out on him. Well, you know, again, I know it's an FCS opponent. I know it maybe wasn't going against the starters, but Joe Barna flashed, right, with multiple – not only on pass rush – but on run defense and pass coverage, I showed I saw some versatility, and he and his body doesn't look that far away from playing in the Big Ten. I mean, I think he was listed at six three or four two sixty. I'm not sure. Sixty five. I'm not sure how you get that big by the time you're a freshman. Is he a true freshman or redshirt freshman? It's a true freshman. He he's got a lot of Gabe to him, man. Just how strong he like the holding off with one arm. Uh, so he has an ability. Uh, and Brett says this, but to play with extension um, is a big thing on the defensive line and outside linebackers. It's it's very hard to do. Uh, you have to be able to extend and keep bigger bodies like Melvin Priestley off of you, right? And not only extend, but then disengage and keep them onto your body. And so uh, Barna is a guy that it's going to be hard to keep Barna off of the field. If they have this thing where like, hey, we want the top 11 on the field. You know, we saw Gabe move down. We'll talk about that. Gabe moved down into tackle and whatnot. Uh, and so Barna could get reps. I'm not saying he's an everyday starter, but I'm saying the coach and what the coaches have seen from him are impressive. And it's impressive to me that we have some pieces, especially on the D-line. It might be a year away from but but Alex Bray and Barna, some pieces right there where you're like, okay, they're 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 getting some recruiting hits, right? on those they're, they're, they're these guys are players so that was exciting for me on the defensive side I'll also say um I did not know much about Caleb Patterson okay now he had a bad defensive pass interference he was in phase and didn't need to do that he did get beat another route but the length that Caleb Patterson has and the overall athleticism is he very lean does he need to put some weight on yes uh I think he could be an NFL corner I really do he's got a lot of time ahead of him um, and you look how Torrey Cox played on the other side. You look that Terrence Brooks was a guy that didn't really get into the fourth quarter and was, you know, a pretty highly touted portal guy they went out and had to pay for. Um, the fact that Caleb Patterson is your starting corner, I, I, I got to ask Aaron Henry, like, tell me why. Like, okay, he, he gets the start. Why? Just said, man, the guy's really consistent, and we really value consistency. Now, on the Southern, uh, uh, reading between the lines, Brett says about Brooks in the post game, hey, when he's more consistent, right. he'll play more, right? So I think they value, so I, I think 
I know Caleb Patterson, maybe on one play, you noticed that he got off a block and made a tackle, but uh, he's the kind of athlete that we need on the yeah. back end, right? A true cover guy. I don't know if you I, want to Torrey, say that. No, no, Torrey Cox was really impressive. Uh, his physicality, I, I thought, shined. Obviously, he read that play really well for the pick, but – I'm interested super, to see. Super instinctive. Tory Cox, you can tell his dad was an NFL player. He's super instinctive. Yeah. Not huge. Plays a lot bigger than he really is. And is is uh is is has a really probably the best, I would say, body control of any corner that we have. It's a little bit different body type. Yeah, and like his ability to kind of stick in a receiver's hip because he's so small, quick, right? Like right. it's a little bit different than. Caleb Patterson, who takes sure. a little bit longer to, to move in and out. I, I'm just interested, Jay, because I think it says one thing about Terrence Brooks. Hey, you got to show me more consistency. But I think it also says something that Illinois coaches, again, big investment in Terrence Brooks this is a big deal when he got here that they felt they could send a message, right? That, that you have to be better to play because we have a couple guys who have been better than you maybe in training camp. Like To me, that says something that they feel comfortable. They can send that message. You know, you, listen, just because you got in the portal and you're a big dog and you and you got paid doesn't mean you're going to be first team. You're you're going to have to start with a third on the second on the you know team. I think Sakari Franklin probably started on the third team. He worked he his did, way yeah. up. You know, he worked his way up. He still, you know, if you really want to know who the leader of each group is, you go to warm ups and see who first who's first in line in every drill. That's how that's the culture of college football. Pat Bryant still first in line in the receiver drill. Right. As he should be. He's been here four years, and has a lot of product production. Right. Zachary Franklin, second, though, takes a long time to get to second sometimes. But he got there in two months. So, I, you know, those are different things that I think about. Tory Cox, again, wasn't listed as a starter, per se. They did say this guy's going to play and we've really liked what we've seen him. He's been a huge pickup. Um, it's a message like, listen, just because you get paid to come here doesn't mean you're going to get you're going to play right away. Right. And. I think that's a message to the whole team. Listen, uh, just because portal guys are coming in and out, that doesn't guarantee anybody a spot. And spots can shift week to week, too. Like, someone doesn't play good, you could be out. This is college football. you got to be ready for it. you got to earn your spot every week. Yeah, I think Terrence Brooks is still going to make a, a pretty big impact on this secondary at some point. Um, oh, yeah. All right, yeah, last take. Good. Yeah, last takeaway, you know, Jay. One more, uh, one more guy that I did see that I want to make a point of yeah. was Matthew Bailey. Uh, yeah. You know – uh, you know, Matthew Bailey to the run defense is, is like another linebacker, right? Especially when you, so when we go think about the math of it. So when we go a five down front, which is not uncommon in our defense, not uncommon in Purdue's defense, uh, then we're going to have Dylan Rosiak as the linebacker. So that's six guys. We still want to have, you know, our nickel out there. All right. And then, so your nickel plus two corners in the free safety. Now we're at 10 guys then you really have Matthew Bailey out there, right? So you have Matthew Bailey out there kind of playing as a linebacker. And, uh, man, he was really, really physical at the point of attack. Really physical at the point of attack. I was really impressed by that. Uh, really has a quick trigger in attacking. Do I think that uh, there will be some matchups that are maybe a mismatch in pass coverage for him? Yes, I do. I do. But I think um, he he brings way more than, than he doesn't bring. And – do I think that he has the athleticism, Sidney Brown? No, but do I think at the point of attack, he may be a little bit more stout than Sidney Brown. Yes, Sidney Brown was just stout because he would fly a thousand miles an hour and hit you, right? Yeah. Matthew Bailey might not be flying that fast, but he has a little bit more girth in him, and I think that that'll help. Can, can I ask you about Gabe Ackes, defensive sure. lineman? Because he, yeah. he played both defensive sure. line uh, and outside linebacker, but when he's at that four eye or there was a couple of downs, he was the four man front thing. It was three technique, Jay. That's just, I feel like that's where his money is uh, in the future. Yeah. But what does that allow Aaron Henry to do defensively? You know, when you're not maybe having to put Alex Bray in uh, against big right. 10 offensive lines and you have right. Gabe Ackes. Listen, I, I, I think we're going to see more of it, right? Getting the best 11 on the field. I, I personally think that Gabe feels more comfortable there. Like he, to me, he feel, I, he, I know you might, he might say, well, I like to play on the edge. He's, you might have a chance to get more sacks or more action, but I think he might have more chance to get sacks interior on the matchups that he gets. As Brett talks about, it's hard to double team that guy. And that's kind of the Johnny Newton effect. And Johnny was hard to double team as well. And Gabe is really as good as Seth Coleman is in space. 
Gabe is really good in a tight phone booth, right? I mean, that's really where he wants to get you, kind of his wrestling background. He wants to get his hands on you. He wants to hip toss you. He wants to pull you down. And he wants to bull rush you right back and has extreme power at the point of attack. No one is going to push Gabe Akis around. I don't care if you have three, three, four, 40 more pounds than him. You know, a 310 guy is not going to push Gabe Akis around, right? He's going to struggle with him because Gabe can move really well for a defensive interior defensive lineman. So I think that's where his money's at. I, I think ideally he is a four eye in a in a in a thirty four front in the NFL. I think he'll make a a good living there. And so I think the more he can put on tape, the better. And I think we just have with Barna, with Daniel Brown has great tape from JUCO if he can get healthy. I know he was a. a it sounded like he was a little bit banged up from camp. Yep. Uh, nothing serious. You have Barna, you have Alec Bryant, you have Coleman. You, you have maybe three, four guys you feel good on the outside. I don't know if you have that kind of depth in the interior where I feel like I can go that deep. So I think Gabe Akis does have a chance to play more in the interior. All right, last takeaway, Jay, is about takeaways, uh, something they needed more of. They only had 15 last year. They had four in this game. Um, that that's an encouraging start. Obviously, Dylan Rosiak is, is really good at this. It's hard not to make the Jake Hansen comparisons with him being from the same high school, being family sure. friends. Um, but uh, and then Miles Scott with with a few big takeaways, and then Tory Cox with the read. But that's an encouraging start because that's been an emphasis all season. Yeah, you know, I was reading some notes preparing for the game, and nobody had a had a bigger turnover margin swing than like Illinois. I think we were like negative eight on the year, and we were like positive maybe 20 the year before, something crazy, right? It was some, something crazy um, as far as giving up some and whatnot. Well, no better place to start than get four in the first game and give up zero, you know? And so I think overall, very, you know, no turnovers by our offense and, and pretty clean offensively as far as penalties go. Defensively, they had the, they were lined up wrong a couple of times. I, you know, that can be just a different line judge. That could be just a different way guys are lining up. They just weren't used to it. But the turnovers were definitely emphasized in in Miles Scott. Man, I tell you what, uh, certainly not the most elite athlete yet you see you, you've ever seen, and certainly not the biggest guy. But man, he's a smart, smart, smart football player, and obviously the leader of this football team. So you know, he gets a hand on the ball, just hustling, um, you know, and and then re really just baited him into that into that pick. You know, uh, very, very, very good, good job helping out his buddy Matthew Bailey over the top to make that pick. The receiver, the quarterback, never saw him. And then Rosiak with the mentality of, "Hey, you know, I'm behind the ball, going full speed, and just I'm going to rip at the ball." And that 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 was exciting for me to see. And then we had one more, and one more. I'm not thinking about what was Tory Cox. Tory Cox, that's right. Tory. Oh, Tory Cox. You know. Good call by Aaron Henry. Uh, you know, we're running man a ton, man, 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 run man. He calls a cover two, and uh, you know, not not ID'd at all by the quarterback. And so, in a cover two, a corner will sit in the flat more in cover two, uh, and he sat in the flat and just he basically ran the screen route for him. Right? I mean, yeah. so uh, that was that's really instinctive play. So those are the things we need to keep up, right? Um, and I'm excited about. Uh, so I, I just think turnovers beget turnovers and no turnovers beget no turnovers. It's kind of a contagious thing and a belief thing. So I am excited about that. All right, Jay, huge matchup. Number 22, Kansas, uh, coming into town and sounds like it's gonna be a great crowd. Uh, I love the introductions and everything that they had going. It was pretty hype here, uh, on a Thursday night, but first can, can we talk about this and then we'll talk about the keys to this game. What went so wrong last year for Illinois in Lawrence? And what do you think the staff learns from that experience? Well, I think um, Aaron Henry would tell you he got introduced to be a defensive coordinator in that game. Uh, and I think he would tell you that I learned that just because I like to be a man guy, if we can't match up man-to-man, -man, we can't stay in man-to-man. -man. So I think he's better for it, number one. Uh, we were completely out schemed defensively last game. I mean, I mean, we got schemed up. Tell me the coordinator's name again that was there. Andy Cold, Andy Cold Nicky, who's now gone to Penn State. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the deal I think we paid, played Penn State in week four that week, that year, right? And we, and we played Kansas in week two. So I think he's at Penn State based on the Illinois film, right? So because I, I think Penn State watched the Illinois film and was like, wow. 
Look how many chunk plays. I think they had like 19 plays of 15 yards or more. I mean, I had never seen a stat line like that. So tons of explosive plays. It was not as close as what 33-24. We were never really into it, right? And then offensively, we we just started so slow and had to kind of play from behind. And I think Altmaier ended up being the leading rusher in that game. Um, yeah, offensive so, line was kind of a disaster in that one. What, Austin Booker what, what, went off. Yeah. Yeah. What was, was, was just a disaster. It was just a, it was just a bad game. And so uh, I, I think Illinois, they won't maybe not say it publicly. They've got this one circled, right? I think this one was an embarrassment as far as the non-con goes and kind of took a lot of momentum away from that 2022 season of like, Oh man, this is, it's a different football team. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about it. Um, I, I don't know what their offense is going to look like. I know it will be creative. Kansas is will. And I know that uh, Illinois is going to have to have a plan because uh, Lance Leipold is a good coach and he's not just going to give away the game. Yeah. So new offensive coordinator for them, but Lance Leipold, as you said, success everywhere. What a hire he has been for Kansas. They did lose some offensive line, defensive linemen. So what do you think the key is for, for Illinois to, overcome the odds, which is their home underdogs by six, six and a half points uh, sure. and get a big win that would obviously change the tenor of how we look at the season. Yeah. So I, I'm really worried about Jay. Who isn't worried about Jalen Daniels, right? I think it starts with him defensively, but I think, you know, you play man coverage against Jalen Daniels and you could cover everybody up, but if you can't contain him, he'll run for well over a hundred yards. And so I think that's, what's difficult when it comes to Jalen Daniels. Do you spy somebody on him with a Dylan Rosiak, but then you don't have any help in the middle of the defense because you're spying on this guy running. Um, so we're going to be, we're going to be tested. I do think you're going to see multiple DBs rotated. I think you're going to see Terrence Brooks in the first half. I think you'll see Torrey Cox getting a lot of playing time. I think Xavier Scott's going to be in there as well. We need to talk about him. He played solid as well. So I think you're going to see a lot of DBs rotating in. They're going to be rotating in a lot of players because Kansas moves fast and they can score on anybody. So I think contain Jalen Daniels, and uh, as simple as it sounds, making them one dimensional, the running back, Neil, uh, is Neil, right? I believe. Yeah, um, really good football player. Can we make them one dimensional where they can't just run and pass? So containing the quarterback and then, and then making them one dimensional. And, and a big thing where, where a lot of games are decided third down, red zone turnovers. If we can win two out of three of third down, red zone turnovers, we can win this football game. If we win one out of three, we will not win this game. It, and in these close games, that's that's what's going to make the difference. Um, you could put in their cover kicks, but I think it's going to come down to third, third down, red zone, and turnovers. I think those are the big equalizers in any football game. Coming into the season, Jay, I just looked at the schedule, and obviously there's a lot of toss-up games. But for me, this one felt like one of the most pivotal because of what you have at the end of this month, going to Nebraska, going to Penn State, what you have next month with two top ten opponents in Michigan and Oregon. Obviously, the last four games feel very winnable, but if you can win this one, it just feels like it sets you up, uh, gives you confidence. So is, is that overdoing it? Like, How important is this game in front of Illinois? I think if Illinois is to have a, a special season, you know, this would go a long way in doing it. Now we lost game two in two 2022 to Indiana, which was just a heartbreaker and right. rattle off seven, no six straight. And so I'm not saying it's the end all be all because games aren't, but I think what we see these games as Illinois fans is like, this is a chance for us to be nationally known as like, okay, Illinois is a dangerous, dangerous football team. Kansas went in there and got beat, just like we felt with North Carolina eight years ago, 2016, right? It's like, well, it's a chance for us to show that we are a dangerous, dangerous football team and uh, that our expectations uh, could may, maybe should be higher for this team, right? I think if you lose this game uh, like you lost it last year, you're going to have a lot of boo birds out and say, same old, same old. I think if you play this game close and show, you know, hey, we were in it, but we but we lost. I think people are going to say, okay, we're about what we thought we were. But I think if you win this game, I think expectations raise up and, you know, you could get us buying Big Ten championship tickets in September. Yeah. Certainly sell a lot more tickets. Uh, that's key <laughs> for this program moving forward. Uh, Jay Lehman, 
Uh, we will learn a lot more about Illinois. I can't wait to talk to you about it next week, but appreciate the breakdown as always, man. You got it, man. Thanks.